Hey everyone, welcome back. This is Jennifer and this is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study, take two <laughs> for lesson three, day four, because I recorded the entire lesson. We had a fabulous time and I was really enjoying myself, <laughs> but apparently no audio got recorded at all. So you just saw me doing this. Yeah, but instead, you know, you get this now. You get to actually hear my voice. So I'm going to do lesson three, day four again, and we're in Ruth chapter four. And we're going to go all the way through to, we're going to do something interesting today. We're going to do like Ruth chapter four, verses one through 10, and then like the last three verses of Ruth. Just kind of bounce around and do that together. I'm really excited about this day of study. If you've never joined us for a Dwelling Witchly Bible study, you're in for a treat. This is a great day to jump in. Sometimes people get weird about jumping in the middle of a Bible study. Like, I, I do too. Like, it's like you feel like you're jumping in the middle of a book or jumping in the middle of a movie or something. And you're like, I need to see it from the beginning. I need to start it from when it started. Yes and no, but just start it because here's what ends up happening. You end up never feeling like you can start anything because you never, if you never get there at the beginning, you just keep on putting it off. So I'm telling you today, if you are brand spanking new, you've never even done one single day of the Dwelling Witch Sleep Bible Study, today's your day. Join us today and get started. It's a really good day and they're all really good. They're all really good. <laughs> but this is a good one. I really enjoy this one. Anyway, um, thank you for being here. As um, as you'll find out in just a minute, the Dwelling Richly Bible Study is oriented around literally doing just that. It's from Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And so we do that. And how do we let it dwell in us? Well, we want to be immersive, kind of like learning a language is much easier if you're fully immersed in it. You eat with the people who are speaking that language. You hang out with the people that are speaking that language. You, you hear it, you speak it, you see it, you breathe it, you have all your senses involved. And so as much as possible, that's how I think about dwelling richly in, and letting the words of Christ do that inside of us. So that's what we do in the dwelling richly Bible study. And um, so that's what we're going to do today. And so we, we read the word, we write the word, we memorize the word, we study the word. Um, we uh, apply it to our life. We create something that's, that speaks from our heart about the word. We share it with others. So I, again, trying to be immersive with it. So that's what we do. And that's what we're going to do today. Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer and then we'll jump into our study. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you once again. Thank you for just the reality of life and how things don't go the way they're planned and the blessing of being able to start over, which is what we're doing today. We thank you for that. Thank you for this time ahead of us and the chance to be uh, in your word together. I pray for everyone hearing my voice right now, Lord, whatever is um, on their heart and their mind, what they're dealing with, I pray that uh, they would turn to you, seek you for wisdom, and fall before you, um, and feel the covering of your wings over them, and then rise and stand on your promises and wait for you to take care of the matter. So we thank you and praise you that you are the God who sees, you hear, and you do exactly as you have promised us you will do. So we come before you in our time of uh, study right now and uh, ask for your blessing on our, on our time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's do this. I'm going to switch screens here for you and hop over to the actual Bible study page. This, if you haven't already discovered, this is on, you can see up here in the, um, uh, the URL, uh, jennifergrichmond.com, which is my name, uh, .com. And it's my blog. You hit the Bible study devotionals page, click, scroll down. We're in lesson three or whatever lesson you want. And I've made those available for you uh, to just print from a PDF. Eventually, Lord willing, I'm working on editing, cleaning these up, and putting them together in really nice book form for you. Which will be uh, My goal is to make it into a nice spiral book, the entire Bible study all encompassed into one, and uh, so that you can share it with a friend, start your own Bible study at home, and you know, use these little videos if you want to, but really the goal is to pass that along to other people and you be empowered to uh, do a Bible study on your own. Is that something you could get excited about? If you were able to order your own um, fully encompassed Bible study and to be able to share that with others? Yay, yes, good. Give me a thumbs up or a like if you do and you want that. Um, so that's the that's long-term goal and I've written uh, studies through uh, Job and Psalms and, and Luke and Ephesians and James and Hebrews. And uh, what else have we done? Well, Ruth, uh, which we're doing right now. And I, I know I'm missing some. But anyway, 
lots of stuff. And so the long-term goal for me is to get those published and in a nice format where everything's all together in one and that you can get those later. So pray for me as I work on that project. It's going to take a while to get all that done. And I thank you for your encouragement. A lot of you have been the ones who've encouraged me to get these printed so other people can enjoy them. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And so pray for me that that can actually happen. All right. Uh, let's go ahead into our study, which is write and memorize the word we pray, we write and memorize. So we are memorizing Psalm 42, and here we are. Psalm 42, 1 through 6 is where we're at right now. So let's go ahead and recite that together. Feel free to stand up. Uh, if I stand up, it'll be, I'll be out of the camera. Oh, do you like my shirt? Community in Christ, La Mirada Christian Church. Yay. <laughs> All right, so I can't stand up and recite, but you can stand up and recite this with me. Here we go. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mazor. Psalm 42 one through six. How'd you do? Good? My goddaughter has this all memorized. I think I gave her a shout out last week, but shout out again to my awesome goddaughter uh, for memorizing this. Good job, Angelica. Super duper proud of you. You're an inspiration to us all. We can all do this, right? We just need to spend the time and get it done. All right. Uh, let's go ahead over to uh, the lesson and we see that it's time to dwell in the word. So let's just go ahead and do that. Don't forget to take a minute to write it. I've given you the space there at the top of the lesson. So make sure you take the time to do that. All right. Um, list below every person mentioned by name in Ruth 1, 1 through 4, 1, and then add a word or phrase to summarize their role in the account. And this is this is as easy said as it is done. And I know you might be like, what? The entire book of Ruth? How am I going to go through all that? The sun is poking me in the eyeball. Hold on. Let me close my shutters here. Here we go. Hi. <laughs> like the sun was lowering down and just sink right there. Um, Ruth 1-1. One, one. All right. So, in fact, you know what? Let me log in. I, I started this all up. Hello. And um, it's better if I log in because then I can see where my highlighted stuff is. Hey, are you guys already using Bible Gateway? You should be. Mm. It is a great tool online. Let me move my head out of the way. Ta -da. The reason why I wanted to log in is because I highlighted these on take one of this Bible study. I'm really hoping right now, I'm really hoping that the audio is working this time around. <laughs> I think it is. It didn't tell me it wasn't. All my buttons are correctly lit up. So, oh well. Nothing I can do right now. I'll just have to record it and see. So here we go. In order, um, chronologically, we have Elimelech, Naomi, Melon, Kilion, Orpah, and Ruth. And then finally, the only other person that is named by name in the entire book of Ruth is Boaz. That's it. Everybody else is um, clumped together by a group, if you'll recall, or um, specifically not named, and we'll get to that in a minute. But here's the people that are given names in terms of active in the story. Um, of course, we have a whole list of names in the genealogy, which we already know, those of you who've been with the study, because you did your genealogy study at the beginning. So um, go ahead and write those names here in your list. Um, Elimelech, Naomi, uh, Melon, Kilion, Orpah, Ruth, and then Boaz. And then give a quick summary of just who they are, what they're doing. So, you know, uh, Elimelech is um, the head of the household who takes them all out to Moab and dies. Um, Naomi is the wife of the head of the household who follows her husband out there and um, changes her name or wants her name to be changed from Naomi to Mara. It doesn't really take hold because you never hear her being referred to as Mara later on you know it's not like anybody else who's had a name change in the bible where their name gets changed by god and it sticks like that's it that's who they're going to be that's what they're going to be called but naomi miss miss melodramatic naomi wants her name changed on her own don't call me naomi which means pleasant she wants her name to be called mara which means bitter 
and uh, that doesn't stick, does it? Uh, Melon and Killian, um, that's it. All we know from them is that their names mean sickly and weak and not very healthy, and then they die. And then Orpah, who had married um, Melon Killian, I think Orpah ends up marrying Killian, and Ruth marries um, uh, Melon, because I believe she uh, Ruth married the older of the two sons. I think that's right. Anyway, uh, it doesn't really actually end up mattering, because Boaz gets on the scene, and uh, his name means by strength. And if you were at the lesson, um, our study that we did last time when I gave my talk called Girl Wait, which I really encourage you to listen to. If you haven't already listened to, go over to the podcast, Dwelling Richly, and just scroll a couple of lessons down and just listen to the talk called Girl Wait. And I believe that that will be an empowering and encouraging message for anybody hearing my voice today who needs to be encouraged in her faith or his faith too. Uh, listen to that. All right, here we go. And Ruth 4.1, we meet a new character in this account. He is referred to twice in one verse, first by the narrator of Ruth and then by Boaz. How is, refer how is he referred to by the narrator and how is he referred to by Boaz? Well, let's just hop over to chapter 4 um, and take a look at verse 1. And here we go. Um, and now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, and sit down. Now, depending on what translation of the Bible you are um, using, the New International calls him a guardian um, redeemer. And Boaz says, come over, friend, and sit down. Let's take a look and uh, see what the New Living says. Um, just then the family redeemer, and he says, come here, come over here and sit down, friend. He calls him friend. And that new living, and what do we have in the complete Jewish? Meanwhile, Boaz, I kind of like how they give you a way to pronounce it a little bit better. Boaz um, comes, uh, had gone to the gate and sat down there when the Redeemer, that's the narrator speaking, of whom Boaz had spoken, passed by such and such, he says, come over and sit down. I kind of give you an answer to a question coming up, but anyway. Good for you if you're already this answer. So by the by the narrator, we're going to hear uh, references like the family redeemer or the kinsman redeemer or simply the redeemer. And then Boaz refers to him, to him either and not at all in other translations, um, not at all. You know what? One of the things that I like to do, let me just show you this real super quick. And he turned aside, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's do Ruth 4, 1 again. Check this out in Bible Gateway. Oops, I don't want all that. Click, get rid of that, and get rid of that. All right. Here we go. You see this link right here? Ruth 4.1 in all English translation. What? Look at that. How cool is that? So you can just quickly go through and see, how, compare all the ways that different versions of the Bible translate it. And it's very enlightening when you do that. I believe it adds to your experience in understanding the words. I encourage you to do that. Simple thing to do, right? What a fabulous tool the internet is. What a tool of blessing and encouragement and empowerment that we have in the internet. Uh, of course, Satan will use anything that is good and turn it to anything bad. But God has given us all good gifts, and I believe the internet is one if we use it for his glory. Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, so given that, oh, oh, here, before we go on to number three, notice the arrow. Hop over to the word study. These are important. I don't always remember to stick an arrow in there to make sure you read this, but please read these word studies. They really add uh, and illuminate your experience in understanding what we're doing in the study and check out what I've written for you here. The word translated friend in most versions, ESV, NIV, NASB, etc., is from the Hebrew words, and I've written them out in Hebrew for you. Um, and those actually, um, here, let me show you. Um, I'm gonna annotate it so you can see it. Um, let me think, 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 think. Spotlight, there we go. Can I do that? Will that work? Oh, here we go, yeah. All right, in, in English, we're gonna read from left to right. So we say the Hebrew words, we pronounce them, Plani Almani, Plani Almani. Um, and I'm not, surely I'm not pronouncing them as beautifully as they would have if it was in Hebrew. But in Hebrew, it is read from right to left. So we actually start here. This is the p sound here. And those little dots that are underneath that are the vowel sounds. And then this little um, sign here, this middle one, is the o, L sound that we have O for. And it has a vowel sound associated with it. So it's plani here. And then this is um, Aleph, 
letter here, this little s symbol here, and there's the ul sound again with the vowel sounds with it. This is the m mm sound we have in English, and uh, here's the n mm, mm sound. Hebrew is all consonants. The only time you get a vowel is when you get the little dots and the little marks. So you learn in Hebrew, it's, it's different because you flip it over instead of left to right, you're going to read it right to left. So here we go. Plani, a, u, mani. Plani, o, mani. There you go. Hebrew lesson for you. A meaning literally, Mr. So and so. That's the literal translation of that word. That's why in the um, complete Jewish Bible, which is fascinating to use, by the way, when you are studying out of the Tanakh, uh, the Tanakh is, uh, actually, oh, I don't have a hint handy. The Tanakh is the Hebrew um, Old Testament, or what we call Old Testament, they refer to as the Tanakh. Anyway, um, some translations actually render it John Doe. You can scroll through that and see that for yourself, or just leave out a name altogether. Um, the point is that the narrator of this account could have included the man's name, but deliberately leaves it lost to history. So number three picks that up in that thought. Given that the author of Ruth has taken time to name even Ruth's and Orpah's dead husbands, why do you think the author leaves out the name of Ruth's potential kinsman redeemer? So on all these personal opinion responses, like why do you think yada yada, I try to just let you do the thinking. I don't really want to influence your, your concept on that. So I'll give you a minute. Write down your answer right now. Um, I'll share my thoughts with you if you ask me later, but I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. <laughs> All right. Um, from Ruth 4, 1 through 4, summarize Boaz's explanation of the situation. So let's go ahead and take a look back up to our Ruth 4. Um, let's just go back to Ruth 4 altogether. Here we go. Um, so Boaz went up to the gate, sat down there, calls over Mr. So-and-so, literally, and says, hey, friends, sit down. So we come and sat down, verse 2. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back to the country of Moab, he's talking to Mr. So-and-so now, sold a piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech, or Elimelech in the Hebrew. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it. And I am next after uh, you. And I'm going to switch us off of the New King James Version and get us back to the ESV. I noticed all the little italicized, and I prefer not to have those. ESV is a good translation in this case. All right. Back over to our lesson. So summarize uh, Boaz's explanation. He says to the friend, to this guy, uh, the uh, Mr. So-and-so, says um, Elimelech died and his land is, needs to be redeemed and bought back so it can stay in the family. And he does have family, but it's really just the widows. And so someone needs to step up as per our laws and can be the redeemer for on behalf of these people. We're first in line. In other words, um, some guy from Moab can't just show up and like a traveling salesman and buy up property inside of Israel. It goes to family first and, and there's an order and a hierarchy to the family that it goes to. So he spells out the whole situ situation, lets this guy know that he's the nearest um, redeemer. He's the kinsman redeemer. How does Mr. So-and-so respond initially? Super simple. That's why I left you just a very short uh, line. And he said right here, I will redeem it. I will redeem it. Super easy right there. Write that down. Read Ruth 4, 5. Boaz and brings up what other details? <laughs> like he goes, okay, but wait, there's more. Uh, then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead and in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, did I, did I ask you that part yet? No. Um, I guess I can read it to you. This is going to get to it next. Then the Redeemer says, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance, take my right of redemption for me. I cannot redeem it. Right. Back to the lesson. How does Mr. So-and-so respond? Brings up these other details. Oh, buy one, get one. When you get the land, you get the girls. Uh, how does Mr. So-and-so respond? No, I cannot redeem it. I will redeem it. I will not redeem it. What reason did this unnamed man give uh, for not wanting to be her kinsman redeemer? Can't read 
four, five through six, right? His exact words here, listen to what he writes. He says, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself. I cannot redeem it. He reiterates that. I cannot redeem it. I cannot redeem it. And then in between that, lest I impair my inheritance, take my right of redemption for yourself. I cannot redeem it. It's this whole sandwiched concept in the way he speaks that. We're going to come back to this question later in this study. So do not skip this. It's very important, really exciting. You're going to have to trust me on this. Read Ruth 4, 7 through 8. What does the narrator say about the custom? This kind of <laughs> weird custom that comes up. All right, so now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. And where am I reading to? Oh, 7 through 8. Um, so when the redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. So we, the narrator goes in and says, oh, the history of this is this is how it's been in Israel. This is the custom that it's been. And then the custom itself is you draw off your sandal and hold it up and say, uh, you know, this sandal represents the property that I can walk on. Like where I could be is where this sandal would go. And by me holding up this sandal is me telling you, um, anything that this sandal represents, I'm making in trade. You know, this is how I'm doing it. It's kind of an odd custom. I'm glad we just do handshakes and uh, fill out paperwork today. I don't know. Custom, maybe a sandal would be easier. Probably not. All right. From Ruth um, 4, 9 to 10, what does Boaz buy in this uh, transaction? So then Boaz said to the elders of all the people, you are witnesses this day. I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Killian and to Melon. So Elimelech has his two sons, Melon and Killian, and um, he gets all of that. Anything that would have gone to Elimelech, Melon, and Killian, uh, um, Boaz is stepping up saying in front of everybody, I get, I'm buying that. Uh, peek ahead to the final list of names given in Ruth. Read Ruth 4, 18 through 22 and list the names there. We've done this before. We've looked at the names. I want you to list them again here. This is important. Perez, Hezron, Ram, Aminadab, Nashan, Salmon, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David. Write them all down. You got that? Good job. Of course, you can always pause if I'm going... Uh, too quickly for you. All right. So that wraps us up on today's lessons, short and sweet, getting that done. Let me go ahead and close uh, with this thought, which by the way, actually, um, I went ahead and wrote out this thought and shared it on a, um, did I get it posted? Let's see. I thought they posted it. Podcast, blog. Where did I post it? Pretty sure. I did. Maybe I didn't. No, I did not. Um, sorry, I'm just looking over at my my blog because I I had written up this I had written up this concept for you to see, and I um I thought I had it. I'll list it down for you. Oh, here we go. Yes, I'm gonna go ahead and read it to you um, from the blog. Why not? Let me go ahead and click that so you can see it. There we go. It took a while to find it for, for me, but it really shouldn't have. All right, here we go. Um, from the blog, and this is the closing of this lesson as well. My name is not just in the book of life. So you're getting a little extra. I, I wrote an abbreviated part of this in your actual lesson, but here's the full part. What's in a name? Well, letters, of course. But along with that name comes all that that person represents. And I'm going to go ahead and just talk to you and read it to you like this. Hi. Think of these names, Elvis Presley, Mother Teresa, Noah, Mr. Rogers, Princess Diana, Hitler. Just reading that list evoked pictures in your mind and emotions in your heart. You associated the names, even the ones that you were less familiar, that were less familiar to you, with the event, career, influence, or character traits of that person. Here we are in the account of Ruth, and all the key players are named, even the ones who died. One significant person's name is left out. The closest kinsman to Ruth, Mr. Almost But Not Quite, Mr. Close But No Cigar, 
Mr. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. The man who shall remain unnamed in the Hebrew, literally, Mr. So-and-so. The only names that are mentioned in this account are the names that move the story to the key point. The near misses are left out. Why? Because this story is pointing to the ultimate name, the name above all names, the name that one day every tongue will confess, the name from whom all blessings flow, and the name to whom the final word of this book points, Jesus, the son of David, the root of Jesse. Here's what's exciting. God's word tells us that our names, the names of those who claim the name of Jesus, will be recorded in the book of life. When we enter into the family of God, we are a part of the lineage of Jesus. Like Ruth, Jesse, David, and all the others, my name is now a part of the family tree. This is a beautiful reminder to me of the grace and love of God. And that would be wonderful enough as it is. But God, as always, goes even further. My name is not just in the book. It's going to be announced before God the Father and before the angels. Revelation 3.5 says, He who overcomes shall thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. This is Jesus speaking. This is a blessing we for, reserve for those who overcome. When you're tired and you're weary, when you feel overwhelmed or questioning, take courage in knowing that your heavenly Father knows you by name. Jesus, our brother, is advocating for you, and the Holy Spirit is indwelling you. This is all for the ultimate end that you would be an overcomer in and through, and to the glory of his name. So, as we close out our time together today, thank you for being here. If you want to read that again or share that, you can go over to the Jennifer Richmond podcast, or I'll tell you what, I'll go ahead and put the link to that exact um, blog entry uh, right here at the end of, uh, of this devotional, uh, end of this study today. So, thanks again for being with me and leave a comment. Make sure you subscribe, hit that little subscribe button down there if you're on YouTube or wherever it is, if, wherever you're listening to on Facebook or the Dwelling Richly podcast. And um, leave me a note, tell me what you think and how you're feeling and what's going on and prayer requests, any of the above. And I'd love to pray for you and chat with you and get to know you better. So as always, remember that you are loved and prayed for. Until we meet again, um, you can remember that and, and bank on that. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>